அது ஊசு பயலை ஊசு மாதிரியே பேசுவாங்க ஹலோ எஸ் சார் ஆ நவ் இஸ் இஸ் ஓகே மேடம் தி ஆடியோ இஸ் ஓகே ஆடியோ இஸ் ஓகே சார் ஃபைன் 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 யா ஒன் மினிட் ஐ அம் ஜஸ்ட் யா ஓகே மேடம் சோ ஷட் பி ஷட் ஐ ஸ்டார்ட் ஆர் வாட்ஸ் அப் பிளான் நவ் ஷட் ஐ வெயிட் ஃபார் Uh, kindly wait for 5 minutes oh, sir sure Let's... madam sure madam yes, sir. yeah thank you sir yeah. we'll start yeah. usually start with the prayer sir okay sure
Rose, shall we start? It's time. Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Shall I start, ma'am? Uh, yes, uh, Rose. Okay. Welcome, everyone, for the five days international level online faculty development program on the topic artificial intelligence in chemistry, current trends, and future perspectives. Before we start, there are a few instructions for the participants. Kindly mute your audio and video to avoid interruptions. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box and we will bring them up at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Education is not preparation of life. Education is life itself. A pleasant and happy evening to all. On behalf of the management and the PG and Research Department of Chemistry, Holy Cross College, I welcome you all for the five days international level online faculty development program on the topic artificial intelligence in chemistry, current trends and future perspectives. Artificial intelligence is being used more and more by chemists to perform various tasks. Originally, research in AI applied to chemistry has largely been fueled by the need to accelerate drug discovery and reduce its huge cost and the time to market for few new drugs. So far, AI has made significant progress towards the acceleration of drug discovery. However, the applications of AI in chemistry are not limited to drug discovery alone. In this view, this FDP is conducted mainly to provide a general picture of how AI can help chemists be faster and more creative in their research as artificial intelligence is used in our daily life and indeed it has become an essential part of our life. Chemists can thereby explore their knowledge by using artificial intelligence. Let us invoke God's blessing to strengthen us on the long road of our career, to use our skills wisely, feel ourselves to be valued and help the students in their care to learn and grow. I invite Dr. M. Stella Bharadi, the Assistant Professor of Chemistry, Holy Cross College, to lead us in prayer. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, oh my soul Yeah. 
prayer. May the Lord our God show his approval and make our efforts successful. Psalm 90, 17. Heavenly Father, as we gather together, we praise you for this day and your purpose for it. Dear God, thank you for all the blessings you bestowed upon us. We are truly grateful for them. We come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin the five days international level online faculty development program on artificial intelligence and chemistry, current trends and future perspectives. Your generous blessings would mean the success of this conference, dear Lord. May you extend your divine wisdom to the resource persons connected from all around the globe so that they would be able to impart effectively their God-given knowledge to all of us. May they be blessed as they continue to bring their expertise to the people who need them. Bless the participants as well, so that they would be able to glean the vital information from this FDP. May you bestow your blessings after this FDP, so that they may go out and spread what they have learned in the spirit of your love and generosity. We place all our faculty members in your mighty arms, dear Lord. Take what we have prepared and multiply our efforts as only you can. We pray that you bless all the committees in charge, that they fulfill their tasks responsibly, that the objectives they have set may all be achieved. May we be the living witnesses of your genuine love through the implementation of the knowledge acquired through this FDP. We make this prayer in the mighty name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, ma'am, for that meaningful prayer. Now I request Dr. A. Lima Rose, the Associate Professor and Head, PG and Research Department of Chemistry of Holy Cross College to deliver the welcome address. Very pleasant evening to you all. God has done everything possible. I am delighted to welcome you all for this academic enrichment program. This platform gives the opportunities for all the faculties to enrich the knowledge through the interaction with the eminent personalities from other countries and states. The knowledge sharing will improve the teaching learning process to the students and benefit the society. First of all, I would like to welcome our beloved principal, Reverend Sister Dr. Uh -huh. Isabella Rajakumari, who is the backbone of this FDP program. Her motivation have initiated us to conduct this program. Thank you, dear sister, for your blessings and spiritual guidance in all our activities. As she has engaged in urgent meeting, she is not able to join with this. And she has conveyed her blessings and message to all. We have amidst us several distinguished personalities who are highly qualified and possess vast knowledge and experience in the field of artificial intelligence. I feel honored to welcome Dr. Arun Murugan, who graciously accepted to inaugurate this faculty development program, followed by his invited lecture on applications of artificial intelligence based approaches for drug discovery and materials design. Dr. Arun Murugan is an associate professor from Indra Prastha Institute of Information Technology. Department of Computational Biology, New Delhi. He did his PhD in Solid State and Structural Chemistry Unit at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He was awarded a PhD degree in the year 2005 for his thesis contribution entitled the Molecular Simulations of Temperature-Induced Disorder and Pressure-Induced Ordering in Organic Molecular Crystals. After PhD, he was on most postdoctoral visits to various institutes in Europe, such as ULB, uh, Brussels, Belgium, KTH, Stockholm, Sweden, and Barcelona, Spain, until 2011. And his research stays were supported 
generously by the prestigious fellowship from Belgian National Fund for a scientific research, Werner Grand Foundation and Spanish Ministry of Science and Innovation. From the year 2011, he was employed as a researcher at the School of Biotechnology, KTH Royal Institute of Technology. And from 2015, he was appointed as a Tosint Associate Professor in Theoretical Chemistry and Biology at the same school. He has been involved in teaching and supervision at KTH since the year 2013. His research focuses on the computational development of drugs and pet traces, optical probes for neural degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and infectious diseases including COVID-19. His research is also devoted to the development of QM and machine learning based approaches for druggability prediction. He has published about 120 articles in international peer-reviewed journals. And he has also written three book chapters and edited a book. He is serving as an editorial board member for scientific reports and IJMS and is currently editing a special issue on COVID-19 therapeutics and diagnostics for the IJMS journal. Dear participants, we have a, such an eminent, highly intellectual personality amidst us. I request all the faculty members utilize this opportunity to extract the knowledge from him. On behalf of PG and Research Department of Chemistry, I wholeheartedly welcome you, dear sir. I would like to welcome our beloved student, prominent alumni, ever supportive Dr. Sri Ranjani Armugam, Head Projects Management. ZQ Leipzig, Germany, has always been a pillar of support for our chemistry department. Thank you, Dr. Ranjani, for accepting our invitation to deliver a talk on AI in the era of quantum computing for chemists. At this juncture, I feel pleasure to welcome all the resource persons, Dr. Madhavan Jacob from Loyola College, Chennai, Dr. Parthiban Srinivasan, visiting faculty, data science and engineering at the IASCR Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh, and CEO of Vignani, Chennai. Ms. Madhangi Tyagrajin, MS Project Director, Frederick National Laboratory for Cancer Research, USA. And Mr. Abhijit, Senior Director, Data Science and Analytics, Falabella, Bangalore. And I feel very happy to welcome all the vibrant and enthusiastic faculty members from all over Tamil Nadu and from other states like Manipur, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Kerala, Pondicherry, Karnataka, and much more. Thank you, dear staff members. Thank you all for registering this FDP and kindly make use of it. And I request your profound support to conduct this FDP program very smoothly. I also feel very happy to welcome all our dear department staff members and organizers, Dr. Rosalind, Dr. Kanmani, Dr. Vitya, and Dr. Kavita for your continuous efforts. Making this program will be a memorable one. I'm sure that you all will feel enriched with the knowledge after completion of this event. I welcome you all once again to this FDP and hope that you all will have a great time ahead. Thank you all. Thank you, man, for that wonderful words of welcome. Now I invite Dr. Dawson N. Arulmurugan, Associate Professor, the Neurakar Laboratory Department of Computational Biology, Indra Prasada Institute of Information Technology, New Delhi, India, to deliver the inaugural address and give insights to the context of the session, applications of AI-based approaches for drug discovery and materials design. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam, uh, for the invitation. And uh, let me share the screen first. Uh, yeah, so I have been asked to give an inaugural uh, speech on AI. Uh, first, let me do that very briefly. Uh, and before that, I would like to thank uh, you know, the head of the department, also Professor Lima, for giving uh, very nice saying very nice words about uh, myself so so let me go into the topic okay so basically 
uh, as a scientist we are interested in asking questions like uh, why the things are the way they are you know what drives different molecular events happening at the microscopic world then uh, how do you design some materials or drugs with a specific property right so these are the fundamental questions as a researcher we all the time ask so what are the different approaches uh, you know that we can use for uh, i can simply say that either you can go for doing experiments or you can do modeling or simulation or even you can use some analytical theory or mathematical modeling right so you can use any of the approaches to uh, understand the system like uh, it can be of uh, anything right it can be like uh, protein folding or crystal formation or you can ask why a specific organic molecule forms crystallizes in this specific polymorphic form and not in other form so you can ask any types of questions right so depending upon who you are like are you a chemist or a biologist or physicist the questions you ask may be different but at the end we all ask questions as a researcher right and uh, you know so the the world is like uh, you know existing uh, having a different lens scale you know the materials in the world they have like a different lens scale and the events occurring in the world uh, you know at a different time scale so but we are only accessible to certain uh, you know resolution or we can only uh, like uh, uh, realize uh, the events occurring at the seconds level right now we cannot follow something happening at microsecond uh, time scale or nanosecond time scale so we'll have to use certain tools so the idea is that there are things hidden like uh, but then as a researcher we are supposed to uh, get insight like find out what is the uh, inside truth or mechanism in there so that's what uh, we have been all the time trying to do right so this is there is a famous uh, so king of solomon's uh, you know the proverb that uh, it is the glory of the god to conceal thing but then as a king we are supposed to find out the uh, truth so same researcher also do the same thing we try to find out the truth so there are three different approaches but uh, nowadays not many people use analytical theory or mathematical modeling it was long back that uh, computers came into you know action that people were using analytical theory but then it is very limited to uh very small uh, small systems like one, one body system or two body system in field right so the only that it is limited to very small system right so we cannot use for uh, materials bulk systems where we deal with avogadro number of atoms or molecules right so then there are like uh, the approaches like force field methods or vinicius methods so these can be applied for studying you know uh, systems of larger time scale and uh, you know Uh, length scale, right? So we have different approaches. We call them like force field method, a Vinicius method. Then comes the data driven approaches. Exactly, that's where uh, the focus of the FTP program is. That right? So we can use any of these approaches to understand the uh, system dynamics, structure, you know, or uh, properties, whatever we are interested in. So nowadays, the modeling can be used in uh, any area, right? Independent of whether it is physics, astrophysics, or uh, drug discovery. or is it like biophysics you can use them in all uh, field like people are using modeling software everywhere right so for example uh, even people have developed software to study like nuclear uh, fission reactions like uh, so these things are quite uh, successful i will just mention you two things like uh, you know you can uh, yeah, you know you can do like modeling studies to exactly predict the uh, photophysical properties of uh, Uh, your pH indicator. Here I show you the comparison between the experiment and uh, modeling. So the modeling was done by myself, and then the experiments were already reported. This was like two different pHs, like acidic pH, and then at uh, uh, I think uh, one is uh, low pH and then high pH, 2.45 and 6.5 something. Okay, so you can see that the spectra changes, absorption shift, uh, absorption shift, lambda max changes quite a lot. You can see that, right? so but then exactly modeling also able to capture that very well so you can uh, do modeling instead of uh, you know doing uh, in, uh, invasive or destructive measurements using spectrophotometer and here is another example that uh, you can use uh, you know like just uh, md simulations to model the uh, structural factor for uh, some uh, liquids like uh, which exist in like uh, low temperature uh, form and uh, high temperature high density liquid or low temperature low density liquid so it in particular this exists in two different uh, forms so we were able this is one of the very complicated system to model but then we are able to model we are able to get the structural factor for this uh, particular uh, liquid in uh, two different temperatures you can see that the matching the matching is quite close so 
Uh, but if you see the amount of uh, resources we used for simulation, it was not so much. Maybe one week simulation we did in your uh, desktop. But then if you want to do the experiments, you'll have to look for some neutron scattering you know, facilities, uh, synchrotron facilities. So you see the how much cost difference comes when we use computation method and then the experimental technique. So basically, we have the tools to model, you know, understand any of the microscopic events uh, or uh, any process happening at the microscopic level. So for example, the process can be like proton transfer, protein folding, phase transitions, or ion transport, drug transport. It can be anything or complex formation, viral infection. Anything can be modeled nowadays using the uh, computational tools available, right? So only problem is that then why do we need uh, after all the AI based approaches? That's a question that uh, I would like to ask here and then answer. So you can use, uh, for example, to study any of the process, you can use deterministic approach, no problem at all. So only problem is that uh, they are like quite expensive, right? For example, if you take uh, the molecular dynamics Monte Carlo, the time complexity goes as n power 2. And if you are trying to use quantum mechanical methods, you can see that the time complexity goes as n power 3 to n power 7. So anything goes, uh, you know, uh, n power square polynomial order or, you know, or uh, exponential, they are very uh, computationally going to be very demanding, right? So it's like it is going to take quite a lot of time. Uh, but then if we see uh, the AI based approaches are nowadays uh, used in almost all uh, area and you can see that they are not that computationally demanding. So that is one advantage we have. Um, then another thing is that, for example, you have some software to model organic crystal, but that cannot be used for modeling like biological molecules or polymers. You will have to make modifications uh, either at the algorithm level or at the force field level, you will have to make changes and then use it, right? So, but the uh, AI approaches can be used as a block boxes. That's another advantage. Really, you don't need to worry about uh, the data. It can be like uh, numerics, it can be in a text format, or it can be music, images. You can use like a block box. So that is another advantage we have. So we have uh, the AI approaches are becoming popular because they can be used as a block boxes. Uh, and then they are also not very demanding when compared to the deterministic approaches. Uh, so, in my opinion, AI can use like a, more like a Swiss knife army, a Swiss army knife, like where you can use it for any sorts of applications. So, left side, I show you that uh, there are so many different applications where people use AI, you know, starting from education to robotics to, you know, data security, finance, everything. And then, but our focus of the FDP program uh, is that we want to see uh, how we can use AI approaches to chemical problems like drug discovery, biomarker discovery, um, or proteogenomics. Okay, so I will be of course talking about the drug discovery aspect and material design, but uh, there are other talks which will focus on the other topics. So I think it's going to be very beneficial for you. The faculty development program is meant that uh, you know you skill up your uh, you know knowledge uh, and uh, you know the recent uh, development in the uh, advanced areas related to your domains, right? So exactly, I think this is very well planned. And then I think you are going to be benefited uh, very much. And uh, so keep uh, yourself, uh, you know, active to learn uh, interesting things. But anyway, so now let me go into my uh, research lecture, uh, where I'm going to uh, talk about uh, applications of AI based approaches for drug discovery and material design. Uh, so these, of course, I will skip because uh, Madam has already said about all these things. So now we very recently moved to Triple Eighty Delhi uh, as an associate professor. So and I established a lab called uh, NeuroCare Lab, where we focus on uh, developing diagnostics, therapeutics, computationally for various neurodegenerative diseases. So our focus areas are like uh, we do basic research that we want to understand why the amyloid forming peptides form amyloids like insoluble aggregates or insoluble fibrils. Why do they form such aggregates? Because this is a fundamental reason for various neurodegenerative diseases. So we try to understand what is the reason behind the amyloid forming tendency of different uh, proteins or peptides. Then uh, we also use various existing methods to study you know, the binding profile of molecules or binding specificity of molecules, or if there is an off-target binding of uh, molecules. Um, so in addition to that, we also develop new methods, but, uh, because we will see that in certain cases, uh, some of the existing methods to fail to capture the 
experimental results. So in that case, it is necessary to develop new method. And in particular, uh, we are mostly working on machine learning and deep learning based methods to predict uh, various drug ability. In particular, uh, I'll be talking more about binding affinity prediction, but one can also use quantum mechanics based approaches, you know, but then there you will have to make some uh, simplification or approximation. Okay. So this is uh, the, our uh, milestone from our group. Now, actually the Nero care has about uh, 70 members, you not believe. When I was in Sweden, I used to have like one, two students, <laughs> but here uh, like 70 people are involved in neurocare research activities and including uh, five of them are like PhD students and then MTech PhD students are 11. So it's a big challenges to me that uh, supervising such a big group. Anyway, so let's see how things go. So, but in addition to that, now we also want to add more, uh, two more uh, uh, you know, spheres on the neurodegeneracy research. One is this, uh, because we have now so many students coming from computer science background. So we decided to, or I decided to add these more, two more dimensions called neuroinformatics and uh, high performance computing. Uh, because you will see that in uh, drug discovery, we deal with uh, some billions, trillions of, as I said, chemical space, and then uh, 20,000, uh, you know, it will be approximately the protein space. So when you want to find out the, the best match of uh, protein ligand complex, uh, the problem is something like you are dealing with something like 10 power 15 to 10 power 18 uh, operations uh, problem, right? So you will have to somehow parallelize the thing. Like if you want to do it in a sequential way, it is going to take like 100,000, 200,000 years. I will explain you that it later. But the, the, so the developing the tool like uh, parallel processing, parallel computing tools becomes uh, essential, you know, necessary, uh, you know, when we want to screen very big empty libraries. So that's why now we also, some of the students focus on high performance part of the uh, virtual screening softwares, all those things. Yeah. So I will be talking about uh, various, uh, since it is a FTP program, I would like to give like uh, some details about what are the challenges in the drug discovery? Then what are the different methods available? Then uh, why different methods, uh, some why some methods fail and what, what how we can deal with that and uh, how we can use the AI methods to, uh, you know, for drug discovery. So these are the aspects I'm going to discuss about. So in drug discovery, what we are interested in, basically we are looking for your small molecules or inorganics or biologics, right? which can inhibit uh, the apparently expressed biomolecules bio in the disease condition. So, uh, but then uh, by analyzing the, you know, the gene expression in a uh, diseased person, you can find out the potential targets. So that is uh, possible. So they do something like differential gene expression analysis and compare the, uh, you know, the genomics profile in normal and diseased person and then we can find out which are the uh, genes expressed in the disease condition. So this can be a potential target uh, for developing a therapeutics, right? So once you found the uh, target uh, molecule, biomolecule, then next step is to find out the small molecules which can bind to this uh, target and inhibit its expression, right? So this is the second step. So basically we are interested in small molecules which can uh, you know, inhibit the targets which are expressed in the disease condition. And the, and the, you know, the relative strength of the protein ligand binding is measured as the association constant, inhibition constant, binding affinity. So basically this is one of the property that we want to optimize in the drug discovery uh, process. Okay. So the drug discovery process is, as you know, that, you know, it's one of the most expensive uh, uh, process. Uh, it's about, it's, it is a bit old data, but uh, as you can see that it takes about like uh, 12 to 15 years and then it involves, uh, you know, million, uh, you know, billion dollars actually. So it is a very time consuming as well as the most expensive project uh, that uh, biopharmaceutical companies usually deal with, right? Um, but the good thing is that you can use uh, the computational approaches to speed up. Uh, some of the process, of course, you, like phase one trial, phase two trial, you will have to do it with the human uh, subjects. You know, there we cannot do any compromise. But then at least the basic research, the R&D part, where you find lead compounds can be, uh, you know, uh, speeded up, accelerated by using the uh, computational approaches. But the thing is that we need to, uh, uh, you know, we need to 
see like uh, how the drug like property can be computed so in my opinion that we should represent the any drug like property in a computable uh, format so that we can use computers so we are going to see that how to uh, compute the drug like properties so the here i'm saying that why it is inevitable to use the you know the computational approaches is that uh, when we are uh, you know studying the binding specificity or uh, binding uh, uh, affinity then uh, we are supposed to uh, you know uh, we we are supposed to for example you want to see like uh, what is off target binding you know uh, is there any off target binding for my compounds then in that case you are supposed to screen all the proteins uh, in humans right so it is something like the maximum size is something like 20000 human uh, proteins we have and if you see the chemical space that is the size of the the chemical library can be about uh, billion to trillion compounds you know the gdp 17 has itself like 166 billion compounds and uh, zinc 20 i think it has about uh, 200 million compounds and really I mean also has something like that billion compounds so you you see we are playing around with uh, you know 10 power 12 uh, the size uh, the chemical libraries so let us say that we are using a laptop for screening this uh, you know GDP 17 against a specific target let us assume and then let us assume that for one compound we use we take one minute for doing the uh, molecular dog, let us assume. Then if you see the amount of time it's going to take for screening this whole library is about 380,000 uh, years, you know, the, which is like quite a large one. So it is impossible to, uh, you know, use a um, uh, laptop to screen such a chemical library. So we will have to rather go for then high performance computing or uh, other aspects. Uh, so we are, uh, of course, living in the you know the golden era for computing. Uh, in in fact, we are living in the scale computing uh, era. That means like we have computers like uh, Frontier, you know, which can do like 10 power 18 operations per second. So if at all we run all this uh, screening in the such a big uh, you know uh, computer, then you should be able to do the screening in like in a week or you know less than a week time because. If, of course, we assume that we are effectively paralyzing your task. Okay, so that is our advantage. So we have, uh, you know, the, we are in the era of uh, human informatics, bioinformatics, also the computing, right? Given if we can use all these uh, very efficiently, then we will be able to come up with uh, very successful lead compounds. So that's a take-home message. And of course, you know, people have already used virtual screening, and then they could show that. Uh, in fact, uh, using uh, computers for drug discovery can speed up or increase the success rate drastically. So here is an example, like uh, where the left side one is the uh, high throughput screening using wet lab uh, facilities. So where they have screened like 400,000 molecules and then they got 85 hits. Now, they used virtual screening uh, to screen like 230,000 compounds. And then they figured out uh, the like they have taken top 365 compounds, and then they took these the top 365 for the uh, experimental validation. They found something like 127 hits. So, which is like you can see that the success rate has gone from like 0.02 to 35 percent, which is a very big uh, you know success, I will say, because you are like uh, you can save quite a lot of chemicals, manpower, and other resources, right? So, this is the advantage of using the computational approaches for uh, uh, drug discovery. So there are very many success stories reported in the literature. Uh, even the HIV drug, uh, you know, came from like uh, structure-based uh, drug discovery, computational structure-based drug discovery, also the influenza uh, inhibitor also. So there are many success stories, right? But if you see that, as I have shown that we have like, uh, uh, now you know that there is 100% human genome project uh, is done, right? Like now we have the, 100% genome information about uh, human, which means that we have all information about targets. And now we also have certain databases like uh, GDP, or there is something like uh, GSK XXL, which has like 10 power 23 compounds, which is a very rich information, right? Then also I said that we are living in the exhaustive computing era, which means that you can uh, do like 10 power 18 operations per second. Uh, so we are having all advantages even then, why do why are we not so successful 
if at all you see the number of drugs came from uh, computational approaches they are only very few okay so what is the reason then so that's a question i want to ask you uh, think a uh, few seconds and i'm going to give you the answer here so one reason is that it is a drug design is a multi variable optimization problem where we want to optimize simultaneously all these properties like binding affinity binding specificity ad amd property solubility bioavailability all these properties we want to optimize uh, simultaneously in particular the binding affinity and binding specificity are the most important properties uh, where you cannot make money much compromise but uh, you can little bit compromise on other properties right for example you have uh, um, some solubility issue you can uh, you know use some other compounds to increase the solubility or if some compounds are not uh, like for example you take peptides they are not uh, stable if you are taking orally but then you can use uh, the you know injection to deliver it so you can compromise on the other aspect like uh, adamt properties or uh, solubility bioavailability but you cannot compromise on the binding affinity binding specificity and the other thing is that most of the biopharmaceutical companies in the r&d phase they only focus on the first two properties they really ignore uh, the other aspects so then it has uh, you know this has been one reason that why uh, there are so many failures in the you know drug discoveries like in the clinical trial they find that uh, many compounds fail so it is because that uh, the focus was only on binding affinity binding specificity optimization but not other properties so this is something that uh, we need to you know focus like we need to simultaneously optimize all the properties and now let me tell you that um okay we know these are the properties that we want to optimize but how we can use the computational approaches that comes the you know next question there comes the next question so in fact all these properties are like computable you know so for example all drug like properties can be computed so that's a message from this slide for example you want to measure the binding affinity it is nothing but it is a free energy difference of the ligand in a target protein to water like environment right for example the permeability also can be defined as a or related to free energy difference um, like for example the it's a free energy the ligand free energy in the membrane like environment to water like environment will be uh, you know can be related to the uh, permeability log p so you can see that the delta g transfer is proportional to the uh, log p value so uh, by from this slide you know that now many of the or most of the, all the drug like properties can be uh, written in a or can be computed okay so if you can write them as a free energy differences uh, but then why is then uh, still it is a challenging to computing all these properties like for example if you see uh, they every year they or every once in a few years they conduct uh, some competitions like uh, solubility challenge or uh, distribution coefficient challenge like binding affinity prediction challenge or crystal structure prediction challenge polymer prediction challenge so these are all the problems uh, which are like quite challenging okay so even though we talked about that uh, there are approaches to uh, you know even though you can write the drug like properties or any other property uh, in a computable form but still these properties are very difficult to predict the reason is that these many of the properties you know if at all we want to predict they need to be predicted to uh, to the accuracy of like few calculations per month but then many of the approaches they don't have that uh, precision or accuracy you know so that's the reason uh, many times uh, it becomes a challenge to property all drug like you can see that uh, most of the drug like properties are uh, very difficult to uh, predict okay so yes so as i said like now i am going to uh, i have discussed about various you know the properties that are to be optimized and then how to write them as a in a computable form i have discussed now i am going to more detail let us if you want to predict the binding affinity how to we proceed you know so that's what i'm going to discuss now so basically we have uh, something called scoring function which tells me how how strongly a ligand can bind to a given target okay so if at all i can uh, compute the score you know for uh, all the ligands in the hemkel library then i will i can pick up the top 100 compounds or top 300 compounds or top 1000 compounds and then take this for the experimental validation so instead of uh, doing the experimental screening for you know 10 billion compounds now i can do only for 1000 compounds or 100 compounds but as long as our scoring function is very reliable right 
So, um, yeah, so there are like very many different approaches to compute the uh, binding affinity or, you know, binding free energy. Uh, so there are like force field based methods, QM based methods. Um, and uh, then, uh, so basically, uh, there are like, uh, in addition to that, there are also the scoring function also can be of different type. Like, for example, uh, like uh, how to say whether a ligand is strongly binding to a target when compared to other ligand. So there is a scoring function, right? So this can be of different types, like physics-based, knowledge-based, empirical, you know, machine learning-based, or QM-based. Okay, so basically, uh, so the we are going to see like uh, how all these uh, scoring functions perform and why do we need to go for a or machine learning based scoring function that's what we are going to uh, discuss but before that uh, if at all a uh, um, force field or physics based scoring function what are the different terms in it okay so you will see that there is uh, the total docking energy which is the function to be minimized or which is the variable to be minimized is sum of Van der Waals, electrostatic, hydrogen bonding, internal energy, right? So I don't want to go into the detail, but this is how. So basically, we compute this uh, Van der Waals interaction between protein and ligand atom. We compute the hydrogen bonding interaction between protein and ligand atoms. Electrostatic also, we compute between protein and ligand atoms, right? So we sum this up and then get the docking energy. And we want to compute this for all the ligands and then see which one has the least docking energy, right? Then we pick up the compound and then say that, okay, this is my lead compound. Okay, so this is how it works. So now I'm going to show that what is our contribution in this area, like computer, uh, you know, com computational uh, drug discovery or computer aided drug discovery. What is our contribution? That's what I'm going to discuss in next uh, few minutes. Uh, so one thing is that uh, we have, I will just show you some results, uh, you know, uh, using the force field methods, like the available methods and uh, show you that they are very well successful to explain the experimental data. So one thing is that there was the experimental data available on binding profile of different uh, tau tracers. Okay, so what they do is like they have collect, they collect the tau tracers from, uh, you know, the brain of Alzheimer patients and then they titrate it with uh, different tau tracers and then they do something like binding assay study. Then they basically estimate something called KI, which is related to binding affinity. So through that, they say that uh, like how many tracers they bind to a specific site, the how many tracers have multiple binding sites. So all this information they were able to bring. Okay. So now what we did was that we did the simulation like molecular dynamics and uh, you know like uh, MMGPC based uh, free energy calculations, and then uh, we found that there are multiple uh, binding sites, which was also you know. Uh, so experimentally, they speculated that there can be more than two binding sites, and uh, we could, uh, you know, establish that. Of course, there are like uh, four different binding sites in tau fibril, and then we could also show that some traces like MK6240 or T807, they target single site, but some traces like PVV3, you know, they can bind to multiple sites. So the experimental data was there on these uh, traces, but then now we are given, able to give explanation for that. What is the reason? Why do they only target a specific site? For example, if you see MK6240, uh, only in a sim, uh, site A, you know, it had a very uh, large binding affinity when compared to other sites. That's the reason it targets this site one. Okay. But if we see the BBP3, you can see that it binds to almost all sites with equal binding affinity. So, we are able to give some explanation using uh, some force field based uh, approach. Then here is another example of such a story that uh, where we were able to address the binding specificity of this probe CQ. Okay. So it was shown to be that uh, very specific to amyloid fibril, but not to amylin or alpha synuclein fibril. So we did again, uh, you know, free energy calculation using, uh, you know, MD, MMG, BAC. We could show that the binding free energy in amyloid beta was much, much lower when compared to other two cases. So, um, so the, that's the reason why it is specifically binding to amyloid beta, but not to other fibrils. So there, uh, there is, a, this is another uh, success story that, uh, it is, uh, it, it came, people speculated that, you know, the tau tracers, which is supposed to bind to tau fibril, uh, they speculated that seems to be, it is also binding to 
monum nags days be because uh, they couldn't get the signal when they were doing the pet imaging uh, ima pet, pet, pet imaging uh, when they did on the human brain they could see that the signal came from some regions where monum nags days be is expressed in the larger uh, extent so they could say that then the probably the tau tracers are not only binding to tau fibril but also binding to monum nags days be so in particular the you know the signal came from basal ganglia and thalamus uh, these are the brain regions where monomax dsb B is expressed okay so they could see that maybe these tau tracers uh, probably binding this mono i mean monominox dsb B so we wanted to uh, you know examine this uh, uh, speculation so we did uh, md simulation free energy calculation so what we found was that um, uh, like many of the first generation tau tracers in fact they were binding to the uh, monomax days B, and they were also targeting the same binding site as the safinamide. Safinamide is the known uh, MAOB inhibitor, now which is also approved, uh, you know, uh, uh, by FDA for uh, Parkinson's treatment. Okay, uh, so we could show that that is uh, many of the first generation uh, tau tracers, they also bind to monomax days B. But then uh, there are also interesting uh, results that when we studied uh, the also the second generation tau tracer like the pyramal compound, um, we could see that they didn't have that uh, you know high binding affinity for the tau tracer. So what we found was that it is uh, we need to be very careful if we are using the first generation tau tracers for tau imaging in brain. But then still there are. Uh, uh, many second generation tau tracers like pyramal compound, JNJ311. So, probably one can use them to uh, image the uh, tau uh, accumulation in brain. So, because they don't have that much binding affinity for the monomax JSB. That was another uh, important outcome from the modeling studies. Uh, then, uh, I think, let me check. Okay, I think it's uh, getting uh, late. So, let me. Uh, so, okay, so one can use, uh, you know, the MD free energy calculation to estimate the binding affinity. One can also use like there's something like consensus scoring, you know, uh, where you use multiple uh, scoring approaches and then get the sum of all the scoring function. And then based on that, you make a decision like which drugs, which the compounds are better, uh, you know, uh, as a lead compound. So you can make a decision based on consensus scoring. Okay. So I will skip this. So we through consensus scoring, we also able to come up with some you know lead compound uh, for uh, one of these uh, subrolinia enzymes. So let me not go into the detail. Uh, but then uh, you know, so I showed you very successful stories about this fossil method, deterministic methods. But then I come to the um, the you know some of the dark. I am going to show you some darker side of these deterministic approaches now. So when we used, uh, you know, like uh, the force field methods uh, to predict uh, the incubation potential of known incubators. So we took like 3753 uh, incubators from the Hempel database. And then we did uh, docking, MD simulation, free energy calculation for all these compounds with the monomag test And then when we compared with the experimental data, because the experimental binding affinity was available, okay, so from the Hempel data. We found that the performance of uh, this uh, docking, it can be either auto dock Vina or auto dock, uh, or it can be like MD, you know, free energy calculation methods. It was like uh, the performance was very poor. That means they were not able to reproduce the experimental trend. It was the same for the Cetuin inhibitors also. There also we could see that all these methods like auto dock, auto dock Vina, you know, MMGPSA, they failed to reproduce the experimental, uh, the binding affinity data. Uh, of course, um, one can use uh, the quantum mechanics based methods and we have shown that this method can be quite successful, but only problem is that it is computationally very demanding. It goes like n power 3 to n power 7, the time complexity, uh, where n is the one electron wave function. So these type of problems, which goes like n power 2, n power 3 or uh, exponential, they are very difficult to uh, solve computationally. You can only do for a very small sized system like 200 atoms or something. So, um, this is this cannot be very much used, you know, when you have like very big uh, protein. You can use for protein, but thing is like if you have like uh, 300, 3000, 4000 uh, cases like here. So, here we have like 3700 uh, inhibitors and here about some 690. So, for this type of uh, very many systems, we cannot use the 
uh, quantum magnetic based free energy calculation method, even though it can be reliable. We have shown that it can be reliable to predict binding affinity uh, where the force field method failed. So what is left then? So um, then wh what we have is like, we will have to then go for machine learning or deep learning based methods because uh, force field methods are not performing well, then uh, quantum mechanics based methods are not affordable. So then we thought that, okay, then let's explore the machine learning based methods. So how do we do here? So we have a data set of uh, the inhibitors uh, like smiles, and then we have the inhibition data. So what you do is like you convert the smiles to mole to mole to, to 2D to 3D, then you compute various descriptors. Descriptors can be like 1D, 2D, 3D descriptors. Then use this uh, descriptors uh, data, also the inhibition data to develop a machine learning model. In a simple way, it can be like a uh, regression, right? For example, you can fit f of x equal to y, right? Your x will be now the various descriptors and y is the property that you want to predict. It is the binding affinity. So when we did with the uh, machine learning model, now we could see that um, some of the machine learning models are uh, performing very well. Uh, in particular, the KNN performed, uh, you know, uh, outperformed all other uh, machine learning methods or even, uh, uh, you know, force field based methods. So uh, the machine learning methods can be very useful or, you know, very capable of uh, predicting binding affinity, which is one of the drug like property. Uh, in addition to that, it is also very fast. It is like a, just a week will be more than enough to develop such a model. Okay, that is uh, another advantage. Same with the base one inhibitors. So here we had something like 7,500 uh, inhibitors. And then uh, in this case, what we did was that here also we wanted to just compare like how different methods perform. So you, you see how badly this uh, autodoc uh, based um, prediction is doing. So there is no correlation at all. Uh, between the predicted and the experimental IC50. But then when we use the machine learning, in particular random forest, the performance was, uh, the prediction was very good. We have got uh, the PCC for training model, it was like 0.97 and for validation set, it was like 0.85. It is supposed to be close to one, but it is already very good. You can see that, you know, there will be some uh, deviation from the actual value. But when compared to Atuta Akmina, you can see that it is much, much more superior. Then we also use the graph neural network where you represent molecule as a graph and then use graph and neural network to develop a machine learning model to predict binding affinity. That was also uh, doing well, but not compared to the uh, random forest machine learning model. So the take home message here is that the performance was going like this. Machine learning model did the best, best performance, then deep learning model, then the auto Um of course, uh, why the machine learning model performed better than deep learning? Because in the deep learning model, we are using rather graph uh, representation for molecules, which is not having the 3D information, right? But in machine learning model, we have like 1D, 2D, 3D descriptors. So that is the reason machine learning model performed well. So whenever you are developing a model, you need to know like what is going in and uh, you know whether it will be a suitable descriptor for a specific uh, property that you want to model. So you have to be a bit careful about uh, such things. I think uh, uh, I think I need to rush. So that was like just ligand based uh, machine learning approach, right? But one can also develop uh, structure based machine learning approach where you can feed protein ligand complex structures and then uh, you know the incubation data to develop uh, deep learning model. So one such model is on net. You can uh, see that uh, this is one of the very uh, complex, uh, difficult data set called the Babel data set. You can see that there are so many different targets. Also, the there are so many different uh, ligands of having different charges. So it is one of the challenging data set. If at all one develops a new deep learning model, then they are supposed to validate it against some data set, right? So for structure-based, uh, uh, you know, like binding affinity prediction, uh, then I think this Babel data set is one of the best one. So we also did it against uh, the Babel data set. And then you can see that the Oninet model is doing very well, actually. It is like 0 0.82 point uh, against the 2016 version. Actually, it works this way. For example, what we do is like we compute various protein ligand uh, distance based descriptors. Um, and then uh, use this as the data set 
to develop the deep learning model. Okay, so it is uh, in this case we used one D, two D, three D discrete tasks, but here we use protein ligand distance based or uh, uh, features to develop the model. Okay, so that's the only difference. So here I just show you the performance of the QM based, uh, you know, QM fragmentation based uh, uh, model, how it performs when it comes to prediction of the binding affinity of the Babel data set. But of course, uh, when compared to machine learning model, it's not doing good, but still it is okay because uh, when you don't have any data set, then you cannot use, um, uh, you know, the deep learning model, the machine learning model. You will have to rely on the quantum mechanics, right? But even though the quantitatively, it, uh, the underestimates uh, binding affinities, but it is uh, able to rank the uh, complexes in a reasonably good way. So it is very not so bad news. Let me skip this. Then let me go to the, um, uh, so, so far I discussed about uh, the, uh, you know, the drug discovery aspect, like where, how do we pre predict the drug-like property using uh, different uh, machine learning methods, you know, and what are the, how well they perform in compared to force field or quantum mechanics based methods. I have given some, uh, you know, details. Of course, one can also predict the solvation energy using QM or, you know, or machine learning, deep learning methods. So we can see that uh, like the QM PCM method performs comparable to that of machine learning model, but uh, QM fragmentation method is not doing well, but let's not go into the detail. But these methods are uh, very good. Like you can see that the machine learning model, uh, it is able to predict the solvation energy, uh, you know, very reliably, you can see that, right? So it gives uh, a hope, a lot of hope on how to predict these drug-like properties. Once you are able to predict reliably, then, uh, you know, you can use that to screen compounds, then whatever the compounds you get, they are going to be very reliable. So that is the advantage of developing very reliable method. So we talked about the drug discovery aspect. Now let's uh, go to one or two slides for the material design aspect. So in the drug discovery, we are interested in optimizing properties like binding affinity, binding specificity, ADM, ADM properties, solubility, bioavailability, right? But then when it comes to materials, like uh, let us say you are interested in developing some molecules for bioimaging, then the properties that you want to optimize will be a little bit different. Uh, maybe in this case, it will be like uh, favorable absorption, fluorescent properties, quantum yield, or if you are interested in two photon imaging applications, then you will have to optimize two photon absorption cross section. Or if it is like energy material, then you will have to look into some other property that you want to optimize. So the, the, Ultimate aim is the same, like, you know, so you want to optimize certain property and then uh, it is going to be different for different uh, applications. And um, so this is just, I will show you one application that uh, where we used, uh, you know, machine learning method uh, to optimize the power uh, conversion efficiency of uh, materials, which is useful for uh, dye sensitivity solar cell applications. Okay, so here also, um, we used uh, like uh, various descriptors, like we computed using pedal software. In addition to that, we also used the quantum mechanical descriptors. Also, we used some of the experimental data like refractive index, some uh, what to what to say like uh, microscopic property. You know, so we used them to build this model. And in addition to that, we could also propose some new molecules. Like uh, since we know the relationship f of x equal to y. Now you find out uh, the way how to optimize the Y, right? That is the advantage, right? That's why we are interested in the deep learning machine learning model. You develop model, then you know how to tune the, you know, how to optimize the property. So you, by tuning the descriptor, you should be able to optimize the property. So that is the advantage of having such model, right? So in fact, here we also proposed the very new, very many new molecules suitable for uh, the, you know, DSSC related application. So that was, uh, in particular, this work was done jointly with IED Metras. So anyway, so I would like to uh, conclude, I think I took uh, extra five, 10 minutes, but I would like to conclude by saying that the um, machine learning, deep learning, or you know, AI-based approaches are becoming very, very popular. One reason is that uh, they are like not computationally very demanding. And another thing is that you can use them like a black box, right? You can, uh, you really don't need to have system specific knowledge. Uh, for example, a person working in biomolecules cannot come and do simulation of materials, right? So, but then here it is not a problem, you know. I was working on binding of prediction, then I collaborated with IIT Metras, then we developed, uh, we worked on energy materials. So the tools are the same. You can use it like a black box. Uh, so that is another advantage. But then you should also know that uh, the accuracy of the model developed is 
uh, will completely rely on the accuracy of the data set you have. Okay, so the data set also you if you collect the data from different uh, uh, groups, then you need to make sure that they are uh, the data come from the same experimental condition like temperature, pressure, or pH. Otherwise, uh, use this model and develop some model. It may not be doing uh, very good prediction. So I think uh, I will um, uh, stop here by thanking uh, uh, the Rosalind Madam for inviting me, giving the opportunity, also for you to you know for listening to me. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, we can discuss now. Uh, thank you, sir, for your vivid presentation on how AI has the potential to revolutionize the drug discovery process, offering improved efficiency, accuracy, and speed, explaining the use of data augmentation, the ine inevit inevitability of using AI, and the success rate of AI with traditional experimental methods, the potential advantages of AI in pharmaceutical research, although there are numerous challenges in computer-aided drug design. Overall, this session highlights the potential of AI in drug discovery and provides insights into the challenges and opportunities for realizing its potential in this field. Uh, sir, actually in the chat box, two of the participants have posted their questions. Uh, can I spell out? Sure, madam. Yeah. The first question from uh, Mr. Arun Vivek. I would like to know a few open source alternatives to Gaussian software. Okay, so the I think uh, Dalton is uh, so the Gaussian is for doing quantum mechanics calculations, electronic structure theory calculations, right? So you can use uh, Dalton, uh, Mopac, or now Orca, you know Orca, which is from Germany. So you can use these softwares. Uh, if at all you want semi empirical theory, then you can just use Mopac. That is anyway free to download. Yeah. So the next question is. The session was really interesting as well as I wish to know how do we correlate the docking deep chem or any machine learning study with reality that is spectroscopy. And he has also posted another question. What are the prerequisites to begin career in bioinformatics? Uh, one thing is that uh, you should learn all the, you know, like uh, different techniques. Uh, see, you should learn as much as possible. Uh, for example, like uh, docking, homology modeling, molecular dynamics, free energy calculations, virtual screening, you know, or uh, what to say, uh, um, pharmacophore modeling. So you should learn as much as possible. That is one thing. In addition to that, you should know the theory behind all these tools available, right? For example, when you are doing alignment uh, or when you are doing molecular dynamic simulation, how the, how the, the software does the thing, you know, that is very important to know. Many people, you know, they know how to use the tool, but then they don't know the limitation. That is a very big problem, you know. So other problem is that in India, we don't have, we have not developed so many softwares, even though we are, like uh, we have many software engineers who are going to work in USA. But then as such, you see the software is developed in biology or chemistry or uh, material science. You will not see much, like uh, you see molecular uh, amber or Gromax or, you know, Desmond. All they came from uh, Europe or USA, right? Also same like Gamas, Gaussian, Orca, Mopak, you know, or Dalton. All these came from Europe or USA, right? And nothing came from India. Maybe some of the Indian others might have contributed, but as such, we have not developed much uh, tools, which is uh, which is a little bit uh, unfortunate. I think we'll have to also now understand the theory, and we also need to develop our own softwares. I think so. So my advice, suggestion to you is that uh, learn uh, as much as possible. Also understand the basics, like how the different tools work. Uh, this is very important, you know, wherever you go for interview or anything, people will ask, you know, what are the tools you use? And then they will ask how this works, how the homology model works, how the MD works. So you should be able to answer this. Yeah. So the next question from Dr. Richard. What is the difference between binding affinity and binding selectivity in terms of computing and quantifying? Yeah, so the binding affinity in the sense uh, we have a target, right? And then we just want to estimate what is the uh, binding strength of a specific legend. But binding specificity means when we have multiple uh, targets coexist, uh, you know, in a brain, let us say. Like in brain, maybe you can see that like base one, MUOB or, uh, you know, or uh, CSK, GSK, sorry, GSK, CDK5, there are so many targets exist, coexist, right? 
So the compound should specifically go and bind to a specific target. But if it also binds to other targets, then it is leading to some uh, what to say toxicity or um, what to say yeah it is a toxicity we can say. Uh, so the the binding specificity tells how specifically these compounds bind to a given target and not with others. So there is some small difference. Binding affinity only talks about single target, but binding specificity we are comparing its system binding strength to multiple targets. So we want the compound to be binding specific. Also, it is uh, you know st binding strongly to a specific target. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. So the next question from Dr. Uma Mageshwari: What will be the accuracy of open source model? Uh, no, I don't think there will be any difference uh, between. Uh, open source software and uh, commercial software so only the advantage is that the commercial software is like Schrodinger let us say you know they they have R&D team which will uh, or researchers team who will keep on uh, working on the software you know so there are dedicated people to improve the you know different uh, aspects of the software so maybe for that reason it can be uh, a bit more accurate uh, but but if at all you are doing the same thing, um, like virtual screening, uh, I don't know. I I'm not sure whether there are any studies which are comparing the performance of Glide with Auto Doc Auto Vena. I need to check that. But uh, I don't think uh, it matters whether it is open source or uh, you know or commercial one. So the next question: Can you suggest how we can access random forest? So there are, you know, multiple softwares. Uh, let me recollect. There is this uh, Scikit, right? Or uh, TensorFlow, or you have also what is that? There is uh, uh, there is now recently one Python software. I forgot the Lazy Predict. Yeah, Lazy Predict, uh, where you just feed the data and it can, the, you know, it can build uh, some twenty different machine learning models. Okay, and which is open source. So earlier, you know, you will have to, uh, you know, develop uh, for each uh, machine learning model. You have to feed data and then uh, build your model, right? But now it's a single, uh, you know, single sort. You just feed the data, and then it computes all. The, you know, it predicts using all different machine learning models, and it also rank them like which model is giving what, uh, you know, PCC correlation coefficient. So, uh, so I will suggest you the lazy predict. Just to explore that. Sir, Dr. John Prakash has once again repeated his question. That is, he is working on spectroscopy and chemometrics, and mm -hmm. he would like, and he could easily correlate machine learning data with spectroscopy. It seems. So, how mm. about docking study? Was his question? See, the docking was for uh, estimating the binding energy, right? It is nothing to do with the spectrometric data. Spectrometry, you are interested in, uh, like a, you know, estimating like absorption properties and fluorescence properties or quantum yield, right? So that is an electronic property, but here it is an energetic, which is a, which is a measure of protein ligand interaction. But in the other case, how a material will respond to light, right? So the absorption property is coming from uh, electronic nature of the material. Like so, when you are irradiating a substance, it goes to the excited state by absorbing certain wavelength, right? Then you are getting the signature of the material by doing the spectroscopy, right? So you will have to use all together different techniques, like you will have to use DFT or electron structure theory for measuring the uh, spectroscopy properties. But if you are more, if you want to estimate the binding affinity of your molecule with your protein, then you will have to go for docking like softwares, like where you are estimating the binding affinity. So depending upon what property you are interested in, you will have to use different set of softwares. Thank you, sir. The next I question. Uh, fluorescent as well as absorption could easily estimate binding interaction. Not really, you know. So I'm not sure whether these properties. No. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now we see the point. Okay, see, for example, I remember the people use uh, time flow T assay. Uh, no, but that's for uh, studying uh, the confirmation of uh, the target molecule, right? Whether it is in a fibrillar form or not. Uh, then basically people use uh, THG as a, a probe, the, it's called optical probe, right? So you can, uh, you want to see whether, uh, which is the accumulation of the fibrils in the given sample. So what you can do is, 
uh, you can use uh, some thymurabine or congruate like probe and then see measure the you know their fluorescent property so in the for example when a protein in the native form it will have a specific secondary structure and when it folds uh, or when it uh, when it forms aggregates its uh, secondary structure is changed then basically it alters the fluorescence property of the probe itself so there is like i think thousand fold increase in the thd fluorescence when you have fibrin right so you can use the uh, uh, spectroscopic property to um you know estimate uh, fibril formation aggregate formation but it is nothing to do with the binding affinity itself i think it may not say anything about the uh, binding affinity if i yeah i don't think uh, you can correlate uh, the spectroscopic property to binding affinity yeah i'm not sure at least So thank you very much for patiently answering as there are no more questions let me conclude as a mark of undying tradition i first thank the lord almighty for making today's occasion a resounding success at the outset i thank dr dosen n arul murugan associate professor the neurocar laboratory department of computational biology indra prasada institute of information technology new delhi india for being kind enough to accept our invitation and illuminate us on the topic applications of ai based approaches for drug discovery and materials design sir your talk was really holistic as it gave a coverage on computational drug discovery its challenges various approaches available for binding affinity prediction success and failures of force file based approaches and development of quantum mechanics fragmentation based and data driven approaches for binding affinity prediction thank you sir for your wonderful talk thank you madam yeah okay let's be in touch thank you very much for all of you who listen this yeah thank, thank you sir yeah. thank you very yeah. much thank you will, thank you i would like to place on record my deep sense of gratitude to our principal reverend sister dr isabella rajakumari for her sustained support and blessings i am indebted to our secretary reverend sister dr ani xavier a faithful leader the vice principals the iqsi coordinator the deans the controller of examinations and the heads of various departments for their prayerful support and encouragement thank you all i wish to thank all the participants from other academic bodies for your active participation it is said that self praise is no recommendation however i must say that the incredible leadership timely and proper advice and the freedom in decision making provided to me by my head dr a lima rose who has been indispensable for me to work on this assignment thank you very much dear ma'am i sincerely recognize my own faculty colleagues and my organizing team members their ever smiling untiring team spirit and support has helped me to be successful in our plans to summarize ai discovered compounds are a fascinating topic to learn about however it is not impossible to see chemical sciences and artificial intelligence working together to better discoveries and data thus this session has addressed to several chemists who are interested in the potential of ai in chemistry and also to the fresh researchers who are new to this area so that one can check the progress made so far in this domain by highlighting the past efforts that contain so thank you everyone we appreciate you being here thanks again for joining us today and we will see you tomorrow at 6 pm thank you one and all thank you madam yeah the participants the feedback form is being uh, posted in the chat box kindly do fill it as it is mandatory to receive your certificate
rules, I think uh, Sri Ranji has left it seems, right? Vidya? Yes, ma'am, I'm searching her now. Ah, yeah. I think she's not here. Yes, ma'am, she left. Me. Yes, left me, yeah. Okay. Mr. Amarnath is going on asking about the feedback form. He has asked in a WhatsApp group also. It's already posted. Ah, yes, yes. <coughs> I think he didn't notice. Vidya, how many are joined in uh, YouTube? I'm 31, ma'am. 31, okay.
I think we can wind up, uh, Rosalind. Some more? Yes, uh, uh, yes ma'am. Yes, ma Shall we leave, ma'am? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because some are okay. here. I don't know whether they are present or not. <laughs> yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, we uh, will. I will see you tomorrow, team, see you tomorrow morning. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, teachers. Okay, thank you.